Well, thank you very much. And I'm so glad that people are attending a webinar like this because this is a real important problem, not just because of the distress that the pet parents feel when they get home to find disasters, but because the great majority of these cases go undetected by their person. And this is a great source of distress for the pet. And these people are aware of it and aware that we can help them. General practitioners, you don't have to be a veterinary behaviorist to do a good job with these. These folks need to know that we can make a difference for them. So let's take a look at, at what's going on with these things. And by the way, I'm first gonna to explain to you the, the difficulty in finding these sometimes, but then the excellent treatments that we have for these things to make life better. Um, and then how to actually do this in general practice. Um, we'll get to that in just a minute because this all sounds just great, but how do you pull it off and make it happen in a busy schedule? We'll talk about that too. But if you look at this, this bar graph here, you know, we've always been told in my many, many years in general practice, you know, otitis seems to be the most common thing all of us see, but actually separation anxiety you could tell us just a little bit more. And the great majority of these people are going to their veterinarian, yet in general medicine, we are diagnosing a very small percentage of these things. Well, we can help a great deal more people and their pets. We'll talk about that. Okay, so a little bit more about how many of these pets have this problem. One in seven of them have separation anxiety, but one in three dogs has an anxiety disorder. In anxiety, we have a pretty decent understanding of how that works neurochemically in the brain. We know, for example, that because of modern brain imaging methods like fMRIs and PET scans, we can actually measure the size of a dog or a person's amygdala using MRI. And what they have found is that with repeated exposures to an anxiety trigger, in this case, like the pet parent leaving home, and the pet thinking it's you know, gonna lose its mind, um, let's look at a couple of videos. Well, uh, they repeat that often enough. Well, the brain is called a plastic organ because its anatomy can change permanently. And the reason that practice makes perfect, whether it's an athlete or a musician, you know, you look at people at the top of their game and you think, my goodness, what talent they have. Oh, sure, there's probably some genetic influence without doubt, but they've had the best coaching and they have repeated throwing that fastball or doing that dance move or playing the violin, whatever it is, they've practiced that thousands of times. And so their neural circuits are thicker. There's more inhibitory and excitatory neural inputs that are sharpening and speeding the response. The synapses are stronger. Well, we need to stop that if it's a behavior that's unhealthy and damaging, and we need to find those cases. So, you know, you look at these things and People, of course, want it simple. They want to have you give them the magic pill, and this is going to go away quickly. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> the truth is, we don't cure these things. We can implement uh, behavior modifications. We're going to talk about that. We have an excellent new treatment modality, which is a pulse electromagnetic field device that actually adjusts the neurochemistry within the microglia in the amygdala. That's pretty exciting news. And we have medications and they probably will always have a place in most of these cases, at least the moderate to severe ones. So, you know, we need to, uh, we need to do what it takes. Let me tell you a brief story. Uh, just a few days ago, I went in for my annual physical exam. My, the physician that I see is an internist um, and he's not really a general practitioner, he's a specialist. Well, you know, he's asking me a few historical questions and he said, are you depressed? And I said, no, I'm, I'm okay. And he goes, well, you don't look depressed. And he went on to the next question. Well, depression is a diagnosis and I'm no expert in human psychology or psychiatry, but I've known people who are depressed and I've read a little bit about it. And well, I don't think I have it. But you know, we don't ask our clients, do we? Does your dog have Cushing syndrome? <laughs> Does your dog, you know, have, you know, grade three uh, heart failure? Uh, uh, no, we ask them about symptoms, coughing, sneezing, vomiting, diarrhea, excessive drinking and urinating, 
We ask questions that they can uh, relate to immediately and answer, yes, that's happening, or no, that's not happening. So had my physician asked me things like, uh, gee, do you feel exhausted? Do you feel like you don't have any joy in your life? Uh, you know, those kinds of things are the red flags for depression. But, you know, he didn't ask me that. And the truth is, many of us don't do that either, you know. So we need to be a bit more proactive about this. And we need to approach it in a way that the client can say, well, you know, I'm not sure. And then suggest how they figure that out. But we've got obligations here. But you know, if you've got as much energy and enthusiasm for veterinary medicine as I have had since I was a little kid, this is all I've ever wanted to do. I graduated veterinary school in 1974, and that's all I still want to do. Well, we've got to realize that we can turn that into better results, and we have, can look at our oath as well. We did promise that we would, uh, you know, benefit society the prevention and relief of animal suffering. And if you've ever known anybody who's had overwhelming anxiety to the point where they can't even function, uh, we, that's an opportunity to relieve, uh, to relieve suffering. So here's some of the common signs. And these are the things that I would encourage that we ask our clients. Now, if these are signs we're looking for in a dog who, well, we think might have separation anxiety, and the truth is, out of every seven dogs we see for a wellness exam or whatever the reason, one of them has separation anxiety. So it makes sense to ask these questions. And, you know, having the clients fill out a little questionnaire while they're waiting for their appointment, that's a pretty good way to go. But you can ask. But frankly, if the pet is by itself at home, how the heck do they know? Well, we need to find out, okay? Because a whole lot of these pets are not ripping the drapes off the windows. They're not tearing through the sheetrock and causing $1,200 worth of damage to the house every day. Some of them are. Those are the obvious ones. You know, they're soiling when, they, when their person is gone, but never when their person is home. You know, they're chewing up the furniture. Uh, they're fracturing their canine teeth, trying to escape the crate confinement. We'll talk about that. Um, those are the obvious ones. But these are cases that, these are clear signs of anxiety. And whether it's separation anxiety or manifest by other things. For example, uh, pets who have storm phobia, that's an anxiety related disorder. Dogs who are, have generalized anxiety where they're anxious a great deal of the time. These are pets who uh, the people are thinking, what's wrong with this dog some of the time? Well, you could ask our, your clients, does your dog sometimes pant and tremble for no apparent reason? Um, yawning, uh, you know, scanning, lipping, uh, licking lips, uh, you know, shaking off sweaty paws, you know, you can read as well as I can. These things are to varying degrees indicators of anxiety and anxiety for almost any reason at all, including separation anxiety, okay? They need to ask, you, we need to ask them, we need to find out, are these dogs doing this? And of course, probably goes without saying that Video is our friend. Many people have home surveillance cameras, but people can use their smartphone. And for seven or ten dollars, I've looked it up on the internet, you can get a little desktop tripod, and people can park their their smartphone, aim it at the inside of their exit doors, very commonly where these dogs are pacing and and acting nervous, and cost them nothing to look for these kinds of symptoms. Now here's a case. Um, let me play you this little video. These folks have three dogs and you can only see two of them. You can see this great big Dane and you can see this little fuzzy chow type creature here. And you can also see evidence on the floor that somebody is creating a little trouble when they're home alone. So here's this little guy here. His name is Volta. He's a little Bichon type creature. And he's, of course, this is only a minute or two of, of, of a video, but this dog does a lot of this pacing you look at the Great Dane, he's just being a goofball doing what he does. And this guy goes over to the door and he's looking out the window and scanning. And he's simply not relaxed the way the other two dogs are. And he comes back. But here was the big reason that they came in to see me. And this was their complaint. They hadn't been able to make this problem stop. And well, gee, he was neutered. Um, why is a urine marking when... He never does that when they're at home. Is it because he thinks that he's gonna get busted when they're home? 
Oh, sure, that can happen. People oftentimes correct or punish their pets for behaviors that they catch them in the act of doing. But what they don't realize is that the takeaway from the dog is even if the person is really consistent and gets after that pet and scolds them or worse for making the mistake, what the pet learns that I'm not supposed to urine mark when my person is with me, or I'm not supposed to get on the furniture when, when my folks are at home. But when they're not there, it's really okay because I've never been busted. So yeah, it's possible that this kind of thing was a result of, you know, they thought they trained the dog. Well, they did, but they didn't train the dog not to urinate indoors when they were gone. But we can tell that there's more to it here. Not only do we have this little bit of stuff that this dog's chewed up and spread around the house, but he's pacing. And so that is a, what we call a displacement behavior. This dog is urinating indoors because he doesn't know what the heck else to do. Okay, so his, that's, that's what he does. They don't all do that. Um, and you know, he's not barking, the neighbors aren't complaining. Um, so they might not suspect much. And in fact, they came to me believing that, geez, we've tried everything, we've been to trainers and their veterinarian referred them to me because, you know, I'm a veterinary behaviorist and said, hey, we're gonna help this dog with its health soiling. Well, it turns out, yeah, it's urine soiling, all right, but he's got separation anxiety as well. So you know, let's look at the fear response. Many times people use the terms fear and anxiety interchangeably, like it's the same thing. Well, it's not. Anxiety is a, it can fluctuate from, very low levels or, or down to nothing uh, to very high levels to the point where, you know, the creature, whatever species really can't manage to think properly at all because the prefrontal thinking part of the brain, the decision-making cognitive area, the, the prefrontal cortex is literally overwhelmed with excitatory neurotransmitters, you know, like adrenaline, but glutamate and a couple of others, catecholamines. Well, uh, that's anxiety can get that bad. Um, but it's a continuing problem, typically. can be context specific. And there are dogs with separation anxiety. It's the only time they're anxious. All the rest of the time, they're fine. Now, of course, some of them have other behavior comorbidities as well, and physical comorbidities too. But uh, there are many that that's the only problem they have. So context specific. But when they're alone, they're a nervous wreck. And again, that can fluctuate throughout the day, but it's a problem during that time. Fear, on the other hand, is a very much in the moment emotional state where there's that sudden stab of panic, you know, the, the saber-toothed tiger blasts through the window and this, the fight or flight. It is valuable to understand these things. Why are they going on? And how do we manage them? Well, you know, of course, we survive in the wild because we're capable of fear, right? And we can, uh, we can mitigate that, we can manage it, and we can get through another day. Um, this is just a little uh, MRI scan of a, of a brain with the amygdala outlined. So uh, this all works together, of course. You know, cardiac output, the hypothalamic pituitary axis, the, the most easily measured and very common stress hormone cortisol is, is elevated in these cases. Um, you know, other, other measurements like heart rate variability is diminished in these cases. Uh, you know, a lot of the research involves that, accelerometers to measure dogs' movements during these things. But the reality is that um, this is smoldering in a lot of dogs that people don't recognize. Now, of course, we're all guilty. I think most of us are guilty. I am of self-delusion sometimes, you know, like we never did manage a problem and then it seemed to go away by itself and, oh great, we can move on to other things now, right? Well, so here's what happened. We had an epidemic and so many people are staying home. Well, prior to them having to work from home, back when they spent 40 hours plus going to the office, many of these dogs had subclinical separation anxiety where they were um, pacing and doing a lot like Volta, that little Bichon cross was doing, um, maybe without the urine soiling, and maybe without pulling the stuffing out of whatever it was that he damaged prior to this video. Um, maybe he's, many of these dogs are just pacing nervously. And when the, when the person comes home, they're exhausted. Of course, they are capable of an extreme burst of over-exuberant greeting, which 
is not normal, by the way. We study dogs in free living situations and they do not greet their leaders when the leader returns to the territory from a foray out there to sniff and investigate and read the bullet boards like all dogs need to do. Well, when the leader comes home from doing that stuff, the subordinates in the group of eight, it's a non-event. And that's the normal canine behavior. Of course, when we take pets into our home without realizing it, you know, we give them a great life, we give them love, and we give them bonding, and they bring so much to our lives. But, you know, they have to live behind a fence. They live in a building with walls, like a house or an apartment. And what they can't do is manifest their anxieties by changing their context, changing their venue, getting the heck out of there, going off and sniffing and investigating and scavenging and hunting. And the kinds of behaviors that dogs would do socially with other dogs in the wild, some of it is for play, but a great deal of it is for the two primary objectives survival, passing on their genetic code. And well, pet dogs don't have to do that, do they? And so often people think, well, she's just bored. Well, no, she is frankly living a contrived existence. And in what, from a canine behavioral perspective, is a barren environment in many cases. And so pet parents have an obligation to try to give their dog or their cat species typical behavioral opportunities, very simply, so they can live a full life. But if the dog has an anxiety disorder that is specific to being left home alone, then we need to manage that very particular problem. But we have to understand that we're not dealing with little people in furry suits here. That's how we love our dogs and cats. They're members of another species. And some of their needs are very similar to ours, and some are very different. And it's our obligation to share that information and, and, and educate our clients and get them committed to saying, all right, we need to manage this problem and we're not gonna use folklore and we're not gonna look at just any old YouTube video. We're gonna use research-based uh, behavior methods. Uh, and so start with that by understanding it. So we've got these many dogs who were subclinical prior to the epidemic and now people are gonna go back to work and that's gonna take the lid off some of these. Uh, it already is, and they're just wigged out because there is a long-term memory storage, not only in the hippocampus, but in the amygdala itself of these things. And so we've absolutely got to um, be as proactive as we can. And again, that pulse electromagnetic field device, uh, we could put that to work for us. So I don't have to tell you this dog's name. And uh, does this look like a den to you, by the way? Dogs are denning creatures. But in the wild, yeah, they've got their own safe place. They can go there and leave there whenever they want. It is never latched and locked. And it feels like a den because the sides and the back and the top are covered and even part of the door. And say so they feel snug and secure. So this uncovered wire crate is not den-like. And this poor dog, She's incarcerated and highly anxious. And she didn't bark loudly enough for the neighbors to hear her. But you can see here, she goes through periods where she is fairly still. Um, and then she gets up and frantically paces again. But, you know, she's a strong enough dog that she could bend these wires. Some dogs would. This one doesn't. But gosh, you know, you can go on the internet and you can spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on crates that are marketed as escape proof. You put a dog in there and it's in a vault and that dog, they guarantee you, is not getting out of there. And it may not be able to get its canine teeth wrapped around something where they could fracture those canines and expose the root canal or lacerate their lips or break their nails, but they are freaked out and we have no business allowing our clients to do this. We've got to put the kibosh on this nonsense. I explained to clients, dens are great. Make one available, make it feel like a den by covering it and never close the door, okay? There are other ways for us to work with this. People say, my goodness, this dog is doing $1,200 worth of damage a day to my house. That's unsustainable. You're darn right it is. And one of the most important things we do back to the neuroplasticity of the brain and these neural circuits getting stronger uh, and the behavior getting worsened 
every single time it's repeated. What we need to do is abandon those neural circuits, abandon those long-term memories. And we're going to do that by not allowing this behavior to repeat. So we put our treatment modalities in place and until they are functioning pretty well, which we monitor with video, we don't let that dog rehearse these ramp ups, meaning that I know not everybody can afford it, but doggy daycare or maybe a neighbor or a family member who somebody's home and they, you know, have their pets and this dog can stay with them. Um, I've known of people who go to the dog park and make friends and they, they establish a play group, five of them a week. People work five days a week and everybody's dog hangs out in Mary's yard on Mondays and Bob's yard on Tuesdays and Sally's yard on Wednesday. And in some cases that works, but these dogs have got to not repeat these ramp ups. So some of the things that we can do, number one, ignore when preparing to leave, when leaving and returning because dogs regard any response from their leader as a validation of their behavior of that moment and of their emotional state of that moment. So if the dog is seeing its person preparing to leave and its anxiety is beginning to ramp up, and of course it's reaching a crescendo as the person walks out the door and the dog hears the car disappear into the distance and they lose their mind, typically, not all of them, but most of them. Um, and then they go through varying levels of freak out throughout their, their person's absence. Um, well, if the person is there, they need to realize that if they, you know, kiss their dog, I'm sorry, please be good today, all that kind of stuff, or, you know, I love you and I'll be back. Don't, you know, people, they do that stuff because that's what we do with our human family members. But this is a dog. The dogs don't do that. When their leader leaves, they leave. When they come home, they come home. It's a non-event. And with dogs who don't have a separation anxiety disorder, people can be completely oblivious to the rules of canine hierarchical behavior. And if they've got a well-adjusted dog, the dog goes, you don't get it, do you? It's all right. I can adapt. And those dogs, you know, they just go along. They don't understand what weird stuff their person is doing, but they go along. But if you've got a dog with a severe anxiety disorder, like separation anxiety, it becomes essential that their person give that dog a reliable canine specific leadership structure so that the dog can see what's going on and go, I get it. That's still innately programmed genetically into my brain. My leader is leaving and returning. It is a non-event. That's the way it's supposed to be. And so without a response from the leader, these dogs have a, a decent chance of improving. But those folks who will not obey that basic instruction aren't going to see much change. Uh, and we need to be very clear with them about that. Exercise makes a difference. Strenuous exercise it causes the skeletal muscles to produce and release more serotonin. We think of it as a neurotransmitter that is produced and released in the brain. It certainly is. But uh, the small bowel as well as uh, skeletal muscles also produce it. And so a lot of hard exercises, people can throw the ball or whatever, uh, go for a run with the dog so that the dog is calmer when it gets home and less anxious because it has more serotonin on board. Um, and don't feed them in the morning. Instead, put all their food in food, toys, and puzzles. You know, Kong makes a bunch of these twist and treat, kibble, nibble, food cubes, there are scores of these things now, and I encourage my clients to feed their dog with this problem exclusively from food toys and puzzles. Get rid of the dog food bowl. They don't need it. You look at how dogs function in the wild. You know, they're not out there scavenging and, oh, gee, here's a bowl of, you know, royal cannon. Uh, no, that, no they're, they're out there trying to find something to, you know, rip a little bit of grizzle off or eat even if they get really lucky, bring down some prey. So what we're doing with dogs who are stuck inside is we're saying, look, here you can forage. Here are these food toys, they're pretty challenging and we're gonna hide them under furniture or maybe under a sofa cushion. If you can convince people to install a dog door and a digging box on the north side of their house and bury a few toys under there, the dog's gotta find these things and we're simulating natural canine survival behaviors that these dogs would engage their brains and their physical self in a good part of their day 
if they didn't live, you know, the life of Riley with flat screen TV and, and carpeting and all the other great stuff we share with them in our homes that have no meaning to them at all. Okay. So video monitoring, you know, I, I my, my case is I ask people to do it weekly. And as we adjust our treatments, uh, we can see, are we making a difference or aren't we? They are all individuals. There isn't a, oh, separation anxiety, do these things. We certainly have those things to recommend, but they're not all the same. And so follow-ups and having these clients uh, share their videos with you. Um, and yeah, creating, at least not with the door closed. And of course, Adaptal, I think most of us are familiar with this. This is a synthetic analog of a naturally occurring calming pheromone that is produced by specialized glands beneath the skin of lactating mother dogs. Keeps the puppies from raising a lot of ruckus in the wild that would attract predators. Well, in adult dogs, it has been shown pretty decent research, well, well supported uh, help value with these dogs. It is not the end all and be all because frankly, nothing is. You've got to integrate a bunch of treatments. And I try to explain that to my clients right at the beginning. Um, you got to be in this thing for the long haul and we're going to, we understand these things, but there's some trial and error. So behavior modification without question has a place. Um, you know, desensitization and counter conditioning, meaning these dogs have become sensitized to seeing their pe person getting ready to leave. Well, we can diminish their sensitivity by, you know, having the person pick up the car keys or their purse or their jacket or put on their shoes, different dogs, it might be different things. Sometimes I suggest that people uh, get ready to go in a different room and leave out through a different door so the dog doesn't see any of that. All of those things can be valuable. Some cases we have them start working on their food toys while their person is getting ready to leave elsewhere in the house. Um, you know, the, the food toys are pretty darn good. It does, it's much more than just keeping this dog occupied. If there aren't food sources any other place because the food bowl is gone, then with repetition, they learn that when I know that my person's getting ready to leave, food will happen pretty soon. And what you, the promised land looks like this, as the person is just about ready to go out the door and is reaching for their loaded food toys to put them on the floor as they're, ex uh, they're ignoring their, their dog who doesn't exist because they're Olympic level ignorers. That dog, I mean, there, there is no communication coming from the person because they don't acknowledge that they even have a pet. They're simply putting food toys on the door, on the floor. But the dog has seen this happen so many times and has improved, we hope, to the extent that the dog is going, um, I hear your bus, here's your hat, see ya. Because they have a different association with seeing their, their person go. And this response substitution with desensitization, really valuable. And of course the counter conditioning element when you're going through these desensitization exercises is you can drop a little bit of food on the floor after the dog has lowered its sensitivity to the stimulus of you know handling the car keys or the shoes, that kind of stuff. You know, there are many other things too, like independence training and graduated absences, um, and these do have value. They, by themselves, this page of behavior modifications seldom gets enough dogs improved significantly. Um, you need more, but these are valuable. But especially these last two items, independence training and the graduated absences, I'm not gonna suggest that they don't have value, they do, but it does take a special dog parent because it is very time consuming. And if you have a person who doesn't want to use medications or other treatments, um, well, they're going to take a lot of handholding and they may only get a moderate improvement. Truth is, medications, if they're severe or moderate to severe, frankly, it makes all the difference. And it puts these things makes them uh, improvement possible much, much sooner. And I don't have to read these things to you. Um, many doctors are now, many general practicing veterinarians are now prescribing trazodone. Uh, trazodone's good. Uh, we like it in part because you only have to wait a couple hours and it starts making a difference. But as a sole agent, it just doesn't do enough for us. Um, it is much better as an adjunct 
to an SSRI like fluoxetine uh, or a tricyclic like clomipramine. Uh, fluoxetine, of course, there is a, um, a veterinary approved uh, chewable called Reconcile. Uh, clomipramine, of course, there's Clomacom, there is a generic of that now called Canaquel, and uh, they're chewable as well. And these are typically very useful. Um, and then you can add to that the trazodone on an as needed basis. You don't need it on a weekend or, or a non work day or when the person is not going to be gone. Um, if you look at drug interactions, you will see that adding a serotonergic drug like trazodone, which is uh, classified as an SARI, and you add that to an SSRI like fluoxetine or sertraline or peroxetine, one of those, or to clomipramine, uh, a t uh, tricycline, that um, there's a potential for an interaction. That, that there may be a risk of serotonin syndrome, and that is a big problem if that happens. But in a practical sense, we don't see that problem. Adding trazodone to fluoxetine or clomipramine. Um, and frankly, we do it all the time. Um, the dosages for fluoxetine and clomipramine are pretty much standard. Um, this is a published dose for the trazodone. And frankly, uh, we start there, but we often go much higher, sometimes as much as 10 or even 12 mg per kg, uh, two hours prior to departures. Uh, published information says one hour. Uh, you're gonna, it's going to be on board much better as a preemptive anxiolytic if it's given two hours ahead of the person walking out the door. And benzodiazepines can also be added into the rest of these. Longer acting benzos like uh, clonazepam are usually going to be more helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, with medications, you should do what it takes. Um, you want to be safe, but frankly, we do it all the time. <laughs> now, this is what I've been sort of teasing you about a little bit. You may have heard of this thing. This is called the calmer canine from a CZ Animal Health. And this is really pretty revolutionary because if you have a client who says no to drugs and they're out there or who want drugs to be the last resort, what I do with those folks, by the way, is explain what we use. We don't use sedation. We don't use tranquilizers. If we get a dog who has a side effect like being a little bit sluggish or brain fog, and it can't happen with anxiolytics, then I explain right away that we're going to reduce the dose or we're going to change medications because that is not a acceptable long-term price to be paid ever. Well, the research that they did on the Comer canine was done with dogs who had documented separation anxiety who were not taking anxiolytics. And it made a very big difference in about 80% of them. There is absolutely no contraindication to combining this with anti-anxiety medications. And I do often uh, because I want my, my cases to do better. And this is very, very, I mean, it's totally safe. There's no sensation. Um, I'll explain how it's, how it's used by the pet parent at home in just a minute, but it doesn't work that fast. You know, a treatment course is usually four to six weeks. Some people have gone as far out as eight. And then many of these dogs are much better and not permanently better though. And, you know, people own this thing and they, they start another treatment course when they need to. And the best way to do it is not wait until the dog has, you know, ripped the door off the hinges, but watch those videos. And if the dog starts looking a little bit more agitated while they're gone, that's when you implement another treatment course. Okay. Um, but we, uh, we use this, uh, all the time. So this is, you know, the basics of how it works. It affects the microglial cells. It promotes the production of nitric oxide, which uh, inhibits, as you can read, reduces inflammatory mediators and promotes uh, anti-inflammatory mediators. Um, and also you get endorphins and you get serotonin production from it. Uh, dopamine, you know, there's nothing like the old feel-good neurotransmitter on these things. And, um, and yeah, it does reduce inflammation in the neurons of the amygdala. And um, the internal function of the microglia is much healthier, and we get better results. So this is the way the thing is used. Um, you can see the person on the left side with that little Lhasa Apso or Shizu, whichever that is, it's hard to tell, um, is holding this thing right behind the dog's skull. Um, you know, just right behind where the amygdala is because we target. That's why this is a targeted pulse electromagnetic field device. 
Um, or you can see what's going on with this uh, Irish setter down below. Um, Assisi can provide through their website this, this thing I call a vest. It's a two-part thing with a wide, comfortable fabric strap collar, if you will, around the neck, and then it Velcros to itself. You can see how that works. And then there's another part of it that goes behind the dog's shoulders around his chest. And there's a flap underneath that Velcros and holds them together. Very comfortable. But what's what's good about it is that that Velcro patch right behind the dog's head is where you stick the device, this little halo shaped device. Um, and it just sits there like this brown dog uh, toward the right. And uh, 15 minutes twice a day, it shuts itself off. Um, dog doesn't have to be held perfectly still. It can sit with its person in the morning while they're having breakfast, or sit with the pet owner at night while they're answering their email or watching TV or something. Dog can walk around. Um, I mean, it's just easy to use. It's just a, a daily habit. So, of course, we have a couple of stories. Here's Kita, and uh, I'm sure you can read as well as I can. But this dog followed its people, and over bonding, or hyperattachment, as it's sometimes called, that had been considered part and parcel of separation anxiety cases in dogs. Well, it turns out that overbonding and separation anxiety are separate disorders. Um, they don't have to go together. Now, having said that, there's probably a pretty generous majority of separation anxiety cases that the dog is overbonded as well. Um, so this particular dog is, is following its person, um, but you can see what happened. They, people use zip ties all the time in their wire crates. Um, you know, our, our veterinary dentists in Albuquerque, we have a couple of a specialists in veterinary dentistry, and I mean, they're all the time doing root canals on these fractured canines and incisors, and that's like, oh my goodness, you know, broken crowns off the premolars. It is completely unnecessary because they don't belong incarcerated. So you know, their general practitioner put this dog on fluoxetine and it did well. And then they go, oh, gee, maybe we shouldn't be using this medication. Maybe, maybe long term it's going to cause a problem. It doesn't. And it's important to tell people that at the start, this is not going to put your dog at risk. We always recheck a good exam and a blood profile, at least annually, long term, not because we're worried about hepatotoxicity, for example, from these anxiolytics. It's because suppose we did get a, a liver disorder. We want to know that. And in fact, by the way, you can still use these uh, medications like SSRIs that are metabolized by the liver. You can use those in moderate liver failure cases at reduced doses and still get the benefit safely because they are not hepatotoxic. I explain that to people right from the get-go. These things, they're our friends. Okay. So anyway, of course, you know, they took the dog off the flow oxygen and it got it got worse again. So uh, they were part of the clinical trial with the Calmer K9 device. And uh, you can see here that the dog did very well. And in fact, it improved the dog's overbonding, its following behavior, which again is a different problem. So the Calmer K9 is FDA approved for treatment of separation anxiety in dogs, but it's been found to be helpful in separation anxiety of cats. And in fact, I have used it not just for that, but also for other anxiety-related disorders. Um, it's off-label. I explain that to people. Everybody's fine, and it makes a difference. So um, I, uh, I think that it's worth doing. And I have to also point out that of all the medical devices I've, I've used or prescribed in my career, I've only found one that had a money-back guarantee, and that's the Comer Canine. And I tell people that at the beginning, too. If their pet just doesn't improve with it, they can send it back. Uh, so it's kind of a no lose. So here's this little cute dog, Pixel. And um, she also had storm phobia. Well, it turns out that 30% of dogs with separation anxiety have noise phobias as a comorbidity. And these things, by the way, are largely genetically driven. And that's also a good thing to explain to your clients early in this whole thing because many of them take responsibility for their pet's behavior disorders. Oh, I failed my dog and I feel so guilty. And sometimes that delays them asking for help. Well, let's, let's help them out with this thing. Their feelings really matter, don't they? No, you didn't cause this. We're playing the hand we're dealt on this and we're, we're gonna work on it together. So 
um, you know, this dog with hardwood floors. I mean, there were a lot of things that triggered this poor dog's anxiety. Um, and uh, she did very well with the calmer canine. So the thing that makes this discussion timely at this point is that we're starting to see people go back to the office and they can be preemptive. The benefits of the, of the calmer canine device and the separate and the uh, behavior modification methods and medications like SSRIs like fluoxetine or, or Clomacom, those usually take three to six weeks, sometimes seven or eight to start really becoming effective. Calmer canine is gonna take four to six weeks. It's time for these folks to be preemptive now. And so in the exam room, I don't say, does your dog have separation anxiety? No. Does your dog bark when you're gone? Do you, does he house soil when you're gone, but never when you're at home? Do you see damage? Do you see hypersalivation? Or if you're not convinced, you know, shoot some video of the first 20 minutes or so after you've left home and let's have a look at that. Put it on a flash drive and drop it by the reception desk. I'll have a look at it and let you know. You don't have to look at the whole thing. You just spot, uh, check a few areas of it and you'll see these behaviors. Uh, and you'll know that you've got a dog whose life can be much better, okay? So uh, I guess we've talked about some of this stuff. Um, do that. <laughs> so here's some of the research that uh, supports the Comer canine. And um, I don't have to read through that for you. It was, it was well done. There's another big research that Dr. Uh, Margaret Gruen is, has underway that she's working on a much bigger group. Um, but uh, you can see that these dogs wear these things very comfortably. 